for me. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to, to today's webinar, uh, How to Build a Low Carbon and Humane Meat Industry. My name is Thea Bonadias. I'm the Director of Events for the Breakthrough Institute. Just a reminder to everyone that we will be reserving time for Q&A, so please put any questions you may have for the panelists in the Q&A box. Um, and with that, it's my great pleasure to turn it over to our moderator today, Tamar Haskell. Tamar is a columnist at the Washington Post and her upcoming book, To Boldly Grow, will be on store shelves in two weeks. So with that, I'll introduce Tamar. Thank you, Thea, and thanks to our panelists and welcome to all of the people who are out there. And I can't see you yet, but I, I, I trust that you are out there. And you're here to talk about beef, which is one of the most contentious issues in food, and that's saying something. But it's contentious because uh, mostly about arguments about its environmental impact. And just to, to sort of set the stage, depending on who you ask, food is responsible for oh, a quarter to a third of the total greenhouse gas emissions globally. And beef is responsible, and ruminant agriculture in general, is responsible for maybe 60% of that. So I think a good working number that people would agree upon is about 15% of total greenhouse gas emissions globally can be pinned directly on ruminant agriculture. And of course, this raises questions. It raises tempers. Um, and we're looking today to raise some answers. So we have three panelists who come at it from different perspectives. And I'll just ask each one of them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about where their work intersects this topic. And then we'll get right into it. Uh, Jennifer, can we start with you? Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Jennifer Molidor. I'm the senior food campaigner with the Center for Biological Diversity. It's a national conservation nonprofit. And so my work is to study the impact that the food systems have on the environment, whether it's emissions or wildlife. And today, I think I'm going to talk a lot about biodiversity. Great. Uh, Ermias, is that correct? Am I pronouncing your name right? That's fine. Absolutely fine. Uh, thank you, Tamar. Uh, my name is Ermias Kabrab. Um, I'm a professor at the University of California, Davis. And my, my work involves uh, mostly on uh, the environmental impact of uh, livestock, uh, beef and, and dairy cattle, as well as trying to improve the, the productivity of, of livestock in uh, low income countries as well. Terrific. And Dan. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Blasenreto. I'm the Director of Food and Agriculture at the Breakthrough Institute, where a think tank uh, identifies and promotes technological solutions to environmental problems. And I mostly research how public policy can support environmentally beneficial and agri beneficial innovation in agriculture. Great, so we have three different perspectives. And I wanna talk about what you think the best strategies are to try and improve beef. And it comes from two different uh, at sides of the house, I would say. One is technological, things like how can we capture methane? How can we improve feed or breeding? And the second is what I'll call pastoral, what we can do with cattle out in the world. Jennifer mentioned biodiversity. There's carbon sequestration, there's soil health, there's all kinds of things. What are your top couple of things that you would point to as areas where we can really improve beef? Dan, I'll start with you. So I might steal some of Hermes' thunder here, but I'm a big fan of his work. And um, in our recent report um, that we released in November, The Clean Cow, I worked with a team of staff here at Breakthrough to really assess a bunch of different options to reduce emissions. And perhaps the most promising one is some uh, is feed additives, basically supplements that you can give to cattle that reduce their methane emissions, um, or as I sometimes call them, deburping pills. Um, and this is something that Hermes has studied quite a bit. Um, the primary source of emissions from beef cattle is are, are these burps, this enteric fermentation, often mistakenly referred to as, as cow farts. Um, but almost all of those methane emissions come out the front end. And you can give them different types of supplements 
seaweed based synthesized uh, different herbs essentially um, to reduce the generation of methane from the cow's room and, and the bacteria within it. And by our conservative estimates, if you gave these to cattle just while they're in the feedlot, which is the latter half of their life, you could reduce emissions something on the order of two to six percent, let's just say five percent or so. And if you're able to find ways to provide these supplements to cattle while they're grazing, which is which comprises the majority of their lives and the majority of their methane emissions, you could reduce emissions another uh, let's say seven to twenty-five percent is what we estimated. So if you put these together, you come up with a pretty sizable chunk of emissions that we're able to technically eliminate if we're able to get the technology right and provide incentives for all ranchers or as many ranchers and feedlot producers to adopt these in their operations as possible. Uh, any others? Yes, certainly. Um, so one area um, that we've seen great improvements um, over in the past has been simply breeding cattle to be more productive. So methane emissions per pound of beef in the U.S. have fallen something on the order of like one third since the 1960s. That's really been accidental um, through improvements in how we feed cattle and through genetic improvements. They've grown to be much more productive, um, producing more meat per animal in a short amount of time and all of that leads to less methane emissions per, per pound of beef. So there's still some potential to improve that um, in the future. Beef production here is already very intensive, or, or already very productive. So the potential might be smaller than in many other countries in the world where production is a lot, less, product, a lot mm -hmm. less productive and there's a lot more room to improve. But even in the US, there's still some room for improvement. Hermius, uh, Dan talked about some of the things you work on. Uh, what are, where do you see hope? Yeah, so uh, uh, I guess the way I see it is like we have sort of two big buckets, you know, uh, one is uh, in the areas where, where Dan mentioned that uh, the, the efficiency is there. So the, the thing mm -hmm. is that there's quite a big differences in, in efficiency up to like 10 times more difference in, uh, in carbon footprint. Uh, when you look at beef cattle in North America and, and Western Europe, compared to uh, low income countries. So we mm -hmm. different ways of addressing this. So in the um, North American and Western Europe, you know, the feed additive, the, the type of things that can be done. And, uh, and we, we've seen you know, huge, huge potential in that, you know, uh, using uh, things like 3 p about 30 to 40% reduction there. And, and using seaweed, I mean, uh, up to 80% in, in Australia, up to 99%, up to 98% reduction. So all of these potentials are, are there. And, and this is just the beginning. Uh, what we see is that there's a lot of different type of feed additives that can be deployed in different scenarios. So you're not reliant on one or two feed additives, but a number of different things. And, and a great, another great thing is that you can actually combine those two different feed additives and you can get an additive effect of those uh, uh, effects as well. So I think this is a really, really exciting area of, uh, of research. So that's for the um, high income kind of uh, countries or more efficient cattle. And for the low income uh, countries where, where less efficient cattle, there's a huge opportunity in improving the, the, uh, the amount of uh, reducing the carbon per unit of meat produced. And this is the kind of work that, uh, that the Livestock Innovation Lab uh, based in, in Florida is, is doing all over the world. It's trying to improve to bring up the, the, the level of uh, uh, productivity to the same level that we are enjoying here. And, and, and that would really reduce the amount of carbon per unit of meat production. Because you know, the, the, um, uh, the demand for, for meat and animal source food in general is really high in low-income countries. That's where the, the, the increase is gonna be. In, in high-income countries, we're seeing either a stabilization or even a, a decline in, in demand. So we really have to think about you know, what's the contribution coming from the low income countries and how do we mm -hmm. manage that as well? So Jennifer, before I get to you, because I know you're going to talk about some slightly different things. Um, uh, Ermius, you talked about these dramatic improvements in enteric methane from additives, especially seafood and I, uh, seaweed. And I've seen some of those studies. Dan, you, you know, you're talking about a 5% 
reduction. And I got to say, you know, people who are worried about climate are going to go all met on that. But 80 to 90 is going to get people's attention. Why do you guys have a different, a vastly different estimate of what this number is? Dan? In short, it's because methane emissions are not the only source of greenhouse gas emissions from beef. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, emissions that are coming from manure management, as well as broader life cycle emissions from fertilizing crops that are then fed to livestock and transporting them. So if we look just at the effects of these feed additives on enteric methane emissions, mm -hmm. um, on these cow burps, then I absolutely agree that you can, with Hermes' research, his research and others clearly show these really large declines, 60%, 80%, or even 98%, as he said in one study. Um, but we have to look within the bigger picture of the life cycle emissions from cattle. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Jennifer, yeah. Jennifer, let's let's do you. Where do you see a room for improvement? Oh, well, that's a big question. Um, yeah, yes. Sorry. As you can see the, the questions in the chat, I think if you guys ever talk to the CAFOs, and I'm in cattle country here, so I, I see all this going around. I see people doing a lot of different methods to try to be more sustainable. And one of the methods that's often left out of the conversation is how do we use technology or pastoral systems or mm -hmm. any kind of changes to promote and protect biodiversity. It's usually left out of the conversation and it's an integral part, it's interconnected with climate solutions and it's kind of treated as an afterthought. And if we're gonna get serious about climate solutions, we need to talk about biodiversity, nature, nature-based solutions. Um, and, and how much of an impact that, that can have. And we need standards for that and you know, standards definitions. So we're all talking about the same types of things. So some of the things, the promises that I see that are hopeful are in three areas. And the first, really honestly, I know this isn't gonna go over well with a lot of people, but is reduction and reduction in developed countries like the United States, which eats four times the global average. So mm -hmm. cutting back on beef is gonna be the most efficient way to solve a lot of these issues. But for the remaining people who are going to be eating beef in the United States, for example, um, we are looking at, for example, grazers who are trying to do, you know, make conservation efforts and rewilding efforts. And this is including in the ocean as well. And I think it has a lot more promise potentially than trying to feed 1.5 billion cows with algae and seaweed and, and so forth, or 93 million years. Um, so rewilding restoration and ecological habitat kind of health and well-being, non-lethal coexistence with um, these little guys behind me, for example. And these are elements where we can make and restore habitat that can sequester carbon if we're going to be having animal agriculture as well, that are really productive and conducive to um, more thriving food system, for example. So I could go on and on about that, but that is one kind of element that gets left out of the conversation where we talk about carbon sequestration with cattle, you know, it's, it's limited, it's, you know, reversible, it's only in certain situations, then mm -hmm. we trade off with methane and so forth. So when we're talking about these things, let's also talk about nature-based solutions um, in terms of farming adaptations, agroecology, very promising and so forth. So you hit briefly at the very end there on the issue that I think a lot of people think about when they think about grazing and how grass-fed cattle can be part of the solution. And that is the issue of carbon sequestration. If cattle can be grazed in such a way, and I think it often goes hand in hand with these conversations about biodiversity, do you see a, a opportunity for sequestering enough carbon to offset some of this methane? Or is that something you see as just a side benefit that we might that might or might not accrue to us as we protect biodiversity? I think we need to be really careful about the claims that we're making and the science that is out there. A lot of the claims are far too big and too broad and, and, and mm -hmm. majestic. Um, I think that in terms of sequestering carbon, native grazers generally will do the job better. So let's rein in those claims that cattle somehow are going to do it better. But where carbon can be sequestered, which is a good thing, there are trade-offs, like I said, with additional methane. And so we, if we can deal with that with additives, that's also great. But we also need to think about where are they, you know, trampling riparian areas? What is the impact? You know, there is overwhelming research that grazing 
if not done very, very precisely, mm -hmm. have tremendous impact on biodiversity in numerous ways, whether it's predator control or it's habitat loss or habitat de degradation or fencing mm -hmm. wildlife from native resources um, and so forth. So there is always gonna be a trade-off. And when we're talking about it, it's generally region specific, it's time specific, it's limited. And so we need to really, if we're gonna find common ground together, we need to be realistic about the claims that we're making. So there can be some carbon sequestered, native grasslands, native gra grazers do it better. There's carbon that we can, be sequestered in the ocean, there's blue carbon, there's all types of ways to have nature-based solutions. And the idea that mass consumption um, at this rate of beef in, in switching to an all grass fed system, which is very poorly defined, is gonna work. It's not gonna work. What we see from reports, a Harvard report showed that we can only transfer about 27% of current consumption in the United States. Now in other countries, this might be a different issue which consume much less and they're increasing, but here the issue really of grazing is going to be mass reduction mm -hmm. of nature-based solutions and so on and be more realistic about the claims. Okay, so uh, Dan and, and Ermius, I wanna check in with you on that too because this whole issue of carbon neutral cattle that grazes and sequesters more carbon than it emits in methane is sort of, you know, job one, when you talk about the public discourse about this, people really want to believe in that. And of course, they're, they're things that make it real. Um, what do you think about that? Is that a real solution? Um, or it, it, is it just too uncertain to, to bank on? Ermias, what do you think about that? I think it's, it's very much uh, region specific. I think uh, as Jennifer was saying, it, it depends, you know, it, it might work in one area, but not uh, in other areas. I mean, you have to look at the, the, the potential for that soil to sequester carbon and for how long mm -hmm. that, that, that soil will be able to, 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 to uh, keep that carbon in, in the ground, right? I've seen the things done very well in the Orkney Islands in, uh, in Scotland, for example, they do mob grazing, uh, but you know, they have the, the, the ability to do that, they have the land and, and then they are able to move the, the, the cattle and they have the technology to be able to do that. So in that environment, it works really well and uh, they are sequestering carbon year on uh, year on year. So uh, that that kind of system uh, is is extremely well, and and you would you would get a, a lot of carbon being sequestered in mm -hmm. in the soil. But in in other uh, areas where where it is more marginal lands, you might not get that that, that effect. Uh, so I think it's it's really region specific, but it is it is definitely one of this, the the tools that we have to be able to reduce the the. Uh, um, carbon uh, emissions from uh, beef and, and, and other uh, livestock production systems. Dan, do you have anything to add to that? Just want to provide a, a little bit of context, perhaps. I, I think one thing that's helpful to understand is that most grazing in the U.S. does happen in the way that I think Jennifer was describing, where basically cattle are provided free access to a large area, to a pasture or a rangelands to, to kind of roam about, and that this alternative form of grazing, mob grazing, as Ermia said, sometimes called managed grazing or adaptive multi-paddock, it goes by so many different names, um, but grazing where you where people are basically fencing off cattle in smaller areas, grazing them much more precisely and intensively, that has been shown to have, in some specific places, a pretty large impact on carbon sequestration. Um, it helps the grasses grow more quickly and that in turn means that there's more carbon being added to the soil and being sequestered. Um, and this can be done really at, with any type of, of cattle, whether they're going to be sent off to the feedlot or whether they're going to be grass fed for their whole lives. I think that that's something that's often missed. People sometimes assume you can only do this if cattle are being grass fed their whole lives, but that's not the case. There's a lot of other potential to adopt this type of grazing approach, but it's really labor intensive. It's, as Jennifer said, you have to be really precise. It's quite difficult. And so it's, that means it's also more expensive. Um, and so right now it's quite rare um, and researchers um, also acknowledge that there are real scientific barriers here. There's been very few studies on this. They're all small scale, short term. There really needs to be a, a lot larger scale, longer term studies uh, on the impact of this type of grazing. 
So I think we're running up against the ideological divide in beef and it rears its head in, in other aspects of food production as well. And that is that um, a lot of the solutions that Dan and Hermes have talked about are technological solutions, especially feed additives. Um, for the most part, they require animals to be confined if you're going to add things to your feed. There are obviously ways to, to do it out when they're pastured as well, but it's a lot harder. And we haven't talked about methane digesters yet, but those require that the animals be confined. Um, and most people's idea of what makes a happy cow, some of it well-informed, some of it not as well-informed, um, has you know the cows dotting the green hillside in the pasture, and and I think that there is there's bona fide animal welfare research that indicates that animals that are allowed to express their national their their animal behaviors have lower stress levels and and are to the extent that we can tell happier. And it's a dicey issue because it's hard to tell when an animal is happy, um, but. If all of the solutions to this problem of methane, short of reduction, and we're going to get to that, and 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 I think Jennifer's comments on this are are really important. The the solutions we're talking about, short of reduction, move us in the direction of industrialization, and our U.S. system. Um, has undoubtedly raised the most efficient beef that we possibly can, but it's also had lots of side effects in terms of pollution from confined animal uh, operations and also animal welfare. Can we not have both of these things, happy animals and technical solutions, or can we have both? Amias, I know you spend a lot of time with cows, <laughs> so maybe you can help us address this. <laughs> Yeah, so I think if you're talking about beef, uh, most of the time beef are actually uh, grazing for most of their lives. They're they yes. mm -hmm. grazing. It's only in the last few months that they moved in into a, a feed loss situation where they, they'll be given a different type of diet and, and fattening and, and, and things happen. So, uh, but I mean, if, you, if you come to California and see the, the hills of California, you see a lot of cows all over the place and grazing. I've seen them. Yeah, so I think that, that that's one thing that you have to think about. You know, when you talk about dairy, it's probably it's different, but when you talk about beef cattle, the majority, the vast majority of their life, they are outside. They are, they are, they are grazing. It's, you know, as I said, it's only in the last uh, few, few months that they, they come in, but it doesn't mean that, you know, there's, uh, there's issues with, with uh, uh, having that in, in, in one confined place as well. So the, the, the improvements of animal welfare, I think, is well justified, and it's been happening over the over the few, over the last few, few years. It's been happening, and and uh, especially when as climate changes and the heat stresses is, is there, and so to try to make sure that the animals are well cared for in terms of have the the shelter that they need, is it in terms of the shade or is it the uh, sprinkler water or, or, mm -hmm. or whatever? I think, uh, and it's also you know bad animal welfare is bad for business. You know, animals that suffer do not produce well. So it is to their farmer's advantage to take the, the animals. Uh, to take the animals. Okay, I, I want to push back a little bit on that one because I hear yeah. that argument a lot. And yet we've seen all kinds of horrible videos and pictures of animals in terrible conditions. How does that happen if it's in the farmer's best interest or the rancher's best interest or the feedlot owner's best interest to have uh, uh, animals that produce optimally? Yeah, so I think I'm not saying that there are this bad actors ha happening. I mean, as in all, in all parts of society, there's always going to be some that's not uh, that's not doing exactly what what needs to be done. And um, what what I'm trying to say is that the if, for example, people are adopting the 10 best, the 10 percent of the best uh, uh, farmers that are doing this efficiently and, and, and properly, we could actually reduce the, the impact on, on, the, on the environment by about 30 percent. So mm -hmm. th this is. And, yeah. You know, but, the flip uh, side of this is that I, you know, I remember a conversation I had with Temple Grandin about feedlots and animal welfare. And, you know, she said basically, that, you know, that the biggest difference between feedlots that that are 
but good on, that that are I don't know what the word is that that rate high on on animal welfare standards and and rate low is basically drainage, drainage and density. And if you have a dry uh, feedlot with the appropriate density, there's no reason to believe that the animal can't thrive there. Um, and again, some of this is just our picture of of what makes cows happy. Jennifer, do any of these technological solutions fit in with your vision for where beef should go? A lot of them are um, interesting and, and offer a lot of promise. A lot of them are expensive. A lot of them are way down the road, it will take a long time, and we don't have them in terms of biodiversity crisis and climate crisis. Um, a lot of them keep business as usual and the problems of agribusiness as usual. And that is a problem for a lot of people in terms of food justice, food sovereignty, land access, all kinds of issues, welfare for workers, welfare for wildlife, not to mention for the farmed animals as you were talking about. So a lot of this has been co-opted and used for bad purposes, um, mm -hmm. bad practices as usual. Of course, I think there's also a lot of well-intentioned people looking for solutions around these problems as well with what we have now. Um, in terms of animal welfare, you know, the industrialized model, in my opinion, needs to go. It, it is horrifically cruel. The I'm, you know, very familiar with the legal standards and what is legal is already horrifically cruel. And then we have, of course, the bad apples who are abusing that. So one of the things left out of that conversation as well is the standard of, of wildlife in that situation, mm -hmm. what the impact on the native wildlife in those areas, how are they suffering? So for my area, for example, I'm very close to the Point Reyes National Seashore where tula elk are thirsting to death because they are being fenced out on public lands from their water sources, the native water sources. They are endemic to that region. So there's a cruelty there as well. And of course, and there's a the tribal element uh, with the Mi'kmaq people on that land. But this is a complicated issue. And so I, I don't wanna just sort of make sweeping generalizations, but when we're talking about region specific solutions, for example, and we're donning the hills, you know, UC Davis in California, I'm in that area too. And a lot of people are used to the damage that cattle do historically to landscapes. And so they'll see green hills and think, oh, that's beautiful. But biodiversity is missing. You know, pasture and grass doesn't make biodiversity, it doesn't make a thriving ecosystem. So what we're looking at depends on who's looking at it, right? But my point is going to be that. For example, one thing that we can do, um, I think public lands grazing, for example, is like 2% of the beef production in the United States. It, it causes enormous damage, but it's a very tiny percentage. That's something that can go right there, you know, and that can make a, a big difference in terms of the welfare of wildlife, of cattle, of communities and so forth. In the arid west, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. In a lot of areas where increasingly with climate change, as things heat up, um, you know, in terms of welfare, I, I see, cows themselves, not even talking about wildlife, I see cows that are starving or that don't have enough water, don't have enough access to forage. So there's a lot of issues with region specific solutions. So what you're saying is almost, um, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty stark counterpoint to what we hear a lot about cattle providing ecosystem services, um, increasing uh, not the animal wildlife, but the plant life. Uh, increasing, improving soil health, sequestering carbon. And yet you're talking about it's, you know, uh, really having deleterious effects on biodiversity um, and not being such a great thing, grazing. Now, and again, you know, it's so hard, we can't generalize about it because some grazing is, is does do all of those things. And lots of grazing doesn't do all of those things. And whenever I suggest that, you know, maybe people should eat less beef out on social media, I hear from a lot of ranchers who say, you know, my cattle are providing these, these ecosystem services. My cattle are reclaiming um, exhausted land. My cattle are turning uh, grass, which people can't eat, into high quality food that, that people can eat. So it's like we have these completely different visions of what grazing cattle are doing. But it's like any other issue. Like we see the terrible pictures of the of the of the feedlots and the, the cows shin deep in mud. 
What percent of the feedlots is that? Do we have any idea? How can an ordinary consumer who wants to eat better make sense of this and decide whether grazing is a good thing or a bad thing? Jennifer. Well, yeah, you hear a lot of people too on social media say, oh, you have to know your rancher. And the ranchers will say, well, I'm, you know, I'm doing this thing. Or people say, I have a friend who's a rancher who's doing this thing. But people say, you have to know your rancher. For people in urban populations, that's, that's just not possible to do. Yeah, it's not possible. So how do you know? How do you know what the welfare is? How do you know? The impact of the ecosystems and so forth. So that's why I'm arguing for a lot better standards and definitions and clarity from everybody across the board about what any of this means, what grass fed means, what grass finish means, what regenerative means, what agroecology means, what biodiversity means. The, a lot of the problem in the conversation when we're talking about nutrient dense, you know, calories versus efficient, you know, mm -hmm. um, is that we're not talking about standards. Like, what are we talking about in this conversation? And there's a kind of culture war that brings a real bias to it and a real defensiveness as well, when there should be a common ground where we all want a sustainable planet that we can live on that's healthy, happy, and humane for everybody. And so I think having these standards, both in policy and in science and in starting from that common ground and that shared definition of reality would be really helpful for everyone. All right, I wanna talk about common ground because one of the things that I find really disheartening about the discourse around beef and around food in general is just how divisive and polarized it is. And how can we have I mean, I, we can't fix the problem, I don't think, until we can actually just have better conversations about it. How can we ratchet down the, the rhetoric, the nastiness, um, to try and find that common ground and find solutions? Dan, have you encountered this in your online travels? Oh, I, I think we all have, and you don't even have to go online necessarily to, to find it. At the street corner. <laughs> yeah, just uh, absolutely. Um, and, and just last year, uh, probably one year ago, in, uh, specifically, I think, uh, there was this news story that went around um, about how Biden wanted to ban hamburgers and steaks. Mm -hmm. um, it was this completely fabricated story. We, we've seen that many of these come up where um, the real political divide regarding meat is, is starting to show more and more that over, overall there are, at least in the US, um, as well as in increasingly some European countries, more conservative groups, which kind of paint the liberal side as really wanting to, to ban burgers, ban beef um, for climate purposes. And on, I guess, the flip side, it seems to me at least that there are many more liberal media sources that often do exaggerate the feasibility of revolutionizing um, the, the food system, um, the feasibility of eliminating livestock, for instance. And so I, I think the problem here that I see is sometimes people really take these arguments to the extreme, talking about their ideal vision for the food system instead of trying to identify what are the next steps that we can actually take. Because sometimes we can agree on the incremental next steps while having different visions for the ideal food system. So I, I would love to see more of that. So yeah. uh, Amias, have you been called as many nasty names as I have? <laughs> uh, well, sometimes yes, but, but I, I think for me the issue is that you know, we are trying to distill very complicated and nuanced things into very simple things. You know, this is good, this is bad. You know, don't, don't eat meat, meat is bad and this and that. So that, that's where the, the, the discussion kind of breaks down and, and people don't engage. Uh, but I think if we actually listen and, and basically say, you know, these are the reasons why we should or, or, or we shouldn't and actually really dig in into the nuances, then I think it will be a little bit better if we have you know, some common ground there. But if we just say, this is it, you know, uh, meat completely, ban meat completely. And you, know, you, you, you hear people that are producing plant-based meat saying like, you know, animal uh, uh, agriculture has to go completely go uh, in the next 10 years or whatever, you know? So uh, when you have this kind of basis, it's, it's very difficult to engage in. in but I hear that, I hear that on both sides because I also hear, uh, you know, the pro-beef side saying, you know, Jane, you're ignorant slut, cows are the best way to feed people. They provide ecosystem services and this healthy food. And so we get this extremism on both sides. And I think what Jennifer was talking about common ground is really important now. And so I want to get there, but first we talked a little bit about supply. How can we change beef to be 
more climate friendly, but we didn't talk, we only, we touched on the whole issue of demand. And um, Hermias and Dan, I guess I should check in with you first, um, because my position, I think most people's positions is that we should be eating less beef in the developed world. And unless you think that the technological solutions are going to mean that we don't have to, we're at least going to start from that common ground. Is that where you are, Dan? So just on the, I guess, uh, with regards to the science, I, yes, in, in short, I think it's pretty clear okay. that reducing beef consumption would be environmentally beneficial. But from a real policy perspective, it's really unclear to me what the what the real levers are to achieve that. So, you know, speaking to consumers and eaters, I think it's a it can be an environmentally effective message. But policy wise, I don't see anything that, that's really going to move the needle much there. Amius, um, do you think we need to reduce our consumption in the developed world? And do you see any way for that to happen? I think, uh, yeah, it, 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 I think uh, I've heard uh, some discussions from nutritionists and, and they were saying that the only age group uh, that is over consuming beef is with males between 19 to 50 years old. And definitely if you are cons consuming beef, definitely I think we have to reduce that. Um, but, but the question I, I, I also have is that- uh, what, what, By what definition of overconsumption? By nutritional re requirement for you know, depending on, on that, for that particular group, the nutritional requirement for, for uh, protein, for example, um, they, they are over consuming that. And, and that over consumption comes from, uh, from animal source food. But the, the other groups are actually under consuming animal source food to meet their, 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 their nutritional requirements. Uh, things like Not in the developed world. In a developed world, yes. No, we do not have, no, that's just not true. What we eat, what's the the almost 10 ounces of meat a day in the United States? Well, not particularly meat, but I'm, I'm talking about animal source food in general. To, to me- Yeah, 10 ounces a day. Yeah. There's there's no protein shortage in the United States. No, not protein. Uh, I'm talking about more min about minerals, uh, absorbable minerals to- for, for a healthy uh, living, but particularly things like iron uh, and other micro minerals that are, that are needed for specific groups of, of, of people. Okay, I'm afraid we'll have to leave that where yeah. it is and, and, and we'll come back to that in the next webinar. <laughs> um, but uh, Jennifer, let's talk about demand and where you think it should go and how you think we can get there. Well, in the United States, we eat four times the global average in beef and three times the global average in meat overall. So as you're saying, you know, we're looking at nutritional standards. And while it is true that uh, men of a certain age are the largest consumers, for example, of beef, uh, we're eating too much overall. We have a protein obsession right now, whereas we're eating far less than is recommended even by the USDA for um, vegetables and fruits. And I know that you have talked a lot about the, the um, the environmental impact of vegetables versus legumes. So, you know, we're team legume over here. And what we need to be doing is thinking about our plate and the balance of our plate goes on our plate, how much of this and how much of that. And legumes are a very good solution to that. And I, you know, I, I scream it from the rooftops that everyone should eat more lentils. But, right. and I will, I will tell you that I, you know, I've said out loud, I don't expect anyone to eat more lentils just because I say so. And then I always get a few people who ping me and say, you know, I'm eating more lentils because you said so. And that like makes my whole day. But in general, let's face it, people don't like lentils and they do like meat. And so in a world where that's what, people's preferences are, how can we try and rejigger from a policy standpoint? And so the key question here, I think, is should beef specifically or meat in general be more expensive? Dan? So that is a great question. Um, I, I think the first thing that my mind goes to when thinking about the cost is what the distributional impacts will be, like who ends up paying the cost. So if we are simply taxing meats, I think that by most uh, standards would be considered pretty regressive and in inequitable that food accounts for something like a third of um, people's income, food expenses are about a third of people's income at the can lowest I, end of the- 
can I stop you just Please. for a second there? Because yeah. whether it's taxes or not, you know, why it's more expensive doesn't make any difference to the person who can't afford the meat. So I wouldn't distinguish between taxes in other ways. Like what if meat were more expensive because we put Jennifer in charge and she had a set of regulations and, uh, and they were strict and people had to follow them and it was labor intensive and it made meat more expensive. Um, you know, that's certainly one path. And yeah, we always talk about its impact on the poor. And, um, you know, but if we eat twice as much meat as we need, um, if everybody ate half as much and paid twice as much for it, well, rich and poor alike, and made up the difference in lentils, um, then maybe we'd have a different kind of food system. So I, I'm not necessarily talking about taxes, but if we had a differently structured uh, animal agriculture that was more expensive to produce, meat would be more expensive to buy. Hermes, how do you feel about that? Well, I think we can look at the, the, the situation in, in Europe, for example. In Europe, generally, it's, it's, it's more expensive than, than, than here. And, and so the level of consumption is a little bit lower than, than here as well. Uh, so I think you, know, uh, you could probably go to that kind of situation. But, uh, but at the end of the day, can we produce meat in a climate neutral way? I, I think that, that, that is something that I like to see. You know, if we are able to, to produce meat in a climate neutral way, uh, then, we should, then I think it should be available to people without having to, to be penalized. I think, I, like, like you just said, I don't want uh, this to be just for a select few people. And I mm -hmm. think available to everybody and it should be equitable uh, access to this kind of nutrition, highly nutrition food needs to be uh, equitable because if, if it is too expensive, some people may not even consume at all. And, and mm -hmm. that's a situation where, where we don't want to be. So um, I think my preference is to, to try to, to figure out uh, a way which can we can produce beef in a climate neutral uh, scenario. And you think that's possible in the near term? I think it's possible within the next 10 to 10 years. So there is already a commitment from the Australian bread meat industry to do this by 2030. Okay. Jennifer, should meat be more expensive? I think that's complicated. I don't necessarily agree with where you're jumping off. I think that what if we had a system where the subsidies and the bailouts for this industry were different, what if they were redirected to other parts of the industry and the food system that were more sustainable? The advertising alone, for example, from day one that has told us that meat has to be this massive part of our plate. What if that was different? Um, what would that look like? Now, in terms of food sovereignty, you know, restoring bison the plains and helping tribal communities um, re-enter bison into their lives and that kind of consumption, that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about your average person going into the supermarket, what's available, what can they afford, mm -hmm. what's in the mm -hmm. schools, what do institutional menus look like, that kind of thing. And that's a real opportunity to kind of shift things into more balance so that what we're eating is a little bit more balanced for the climate. Because can we get climate neutral? We can maybe disagree about that. Can we get biodiversity neutral? There's a lot of questions here. Can we can we add equity and food justice? I think we all share the same goals, but how to get there is different. So should it be more expensive? Should it reflect the environmental costs? Is there an analogy there with fossil fuels? I'll leave it to you to decide. Okay, not me personally. No one's <laughs> putting personally. me in charge. <laughs> so. Okay, one more question about demand and then I want to switch to common ground. And there are questions, a lot of them are super specific and it's really hard for me to listen to you guys and read the questions. Um, so uh, uh, Thea and Steve, if there's any of these that you'd like to, to, to catapult to the top of the list, um, that would be great. So one of the things that I think sometimes gets lost in the shuffle is that um, compared to beef, non-ruminant animals, pigs and chickens, which are the ones we eat the most of, have a much smaller climate impact, like, you know, sometimes by an order of magnitude. Um, and since people do like meat, does it make sense to try and redirect consumption in some way, whether it's with subsidies or some other way, taxation, um, to get people to think about eating less beef and instead of substituting 
lentils, which is a big ask, substituting pork, which is not such a big ask. And a pig is a much more efficient animal. Of course, we still have the animal welfare and the, and the, the, the CAFO issues. But does that make sense, Hermes? Hermes? Well, Sorry. Yeah, I think for, for me, the, the issue is that- For the cattle guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you look at what's the, the non-ruminant eating, what, the food that the non-ruminant are eating is the same food that people eat. Right, so there's right. this food and uh, and really good point. Of, uh, competition going on, right? So you're, you're you're feeding corn, you're feeding soybeans, and things like that. You know, so yeah, they are more efficient. But uh, I think we need to be uh, the, the reason that we have ruminants is really because you know the fiber stuff and byproducts. A lot of byproducts that we cannot eat mm -hmm. is converted into a high quality product. So there is that you know uh, trade off that 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 that, that, that we have to think of. That's absolutely true. That's a good point. Um, Dan, switching over to pork and chicken. I, I think it's really important to uh, first just acknowledge that everyone loves different values. They'll weigh environmental impacts some, a lot in some cases, annual welfare impacts a lot in other cases. And when we think about switching between different meats, it's I think, crucial to understand that it would take something like 130 chickens to provide the same amount of amount of meat that one cattle one cow provides. So there are definitely trade-offs here when it comes to animal welfare, um, as well as just the number of animals slaughtered. Certainly chicken are have a way smaller impact. And even with those feed additives and every techno fix I can kind of um, assess and, and identify, I can't see how you could bring down the carbon footprint of cattle anywhere close to, to that of chicken, probably mm -hmm. not even close to that of pork. So um, on an individual level, I think, uh, as Jennifer said, uh, you know, I'll leave it up for you to decide. I think everyone needs to make their own decision there. From a poly policy perspective, um, there's really not not much, uh, I guess, uh, kind of importance given to the number of animals slaughtered or to, to much degree to animal welfare in coming up with what industries to support and how much support to provide to them. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, if we were to switch away from cattle to pigs and chickens, which don't have the same kind of environmental impact, biodiversity impact, wildlife impact, um, is that a plus? I would advocate for switching as much as possible, as much as culturally appropriate to plants, actually, because, you know, slaughterhouses, for example, are the number one point source for nitrogen. There are a number of other impacts besides the impacts mm -hmm. from cattle. And so it's a very complex picture. And I think you can do better by putting a lot more plants on your plate than just switching to another animal, another extractive, exploitive sort of industry. Well, we got 10 minutes left and we haven't solved the problem yet. So I would like to talk about common ground. How can people who are opposed to, and that's, you know, it's, it's a blunt force trauma word, opposed pro and anti beef, but there, we know what the camps are and we've been talking about it. Where is there common ground where we can start a conversation about how to improve our meat-based food system without getting everybody's knickers in a twist. Jennifer? I think the most people agree the factory farm system is horrendous. And I think that we can start there. We're all repulsed by animal welfare. We can argue about it, but I think most, most sane people are. And so switching away from that industry, be better for workers, be better for communities, better for air pollution, better for animal welfare, better for biodiversity, better for, numerous ways. I think that's one area where we can agree. I think another area is that we'd all like to have a future for our children in terms of climate. So let's talk about how we want to have a healthy environment, the things that we do share in common. I really think the most reasonable people want to have a sustainable planet that is worth living on and to protect nature as well. I think that most people love wild animals. So there are things that we, we share in common. We go diverge very quickly, but I think we can start there that factory farms are generally, they need to go. Aramis, how can we talk about this to try and make the tent big? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a bit of an issue because, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right off the bat, you know, calling animal industry factory farms, 
is already, you know, you're making things already. This is this is this is not good because factory something is usually not, not good. And and it's not, you know, for example, we have plant based that are literally in a factory. They are literally in big vats that have been produced. So why can't we say factory plant uh, plant based uh, burgers? We don't say that. So but given a label already, it just makes things a lot difficult for people to come up to a common to common common, common ground, right? So I think. One thing that we can agree on is that we need to have a better animal welfare situation. So whether it is in a in a grazing, whether it is in a uh, in a concentrated animal feeding, you know, it, there needs to be an improvement in, in animal welfare. So I think if we agree with, with that and we start working from that point, I think that's a common place that that we can start from. I think that's a fine place. Dan, how about you? Where well, where can we start? I think from a purely a policy perspective, there are a couple of areas where there's already pretty broad agreement. Um, so a survey that was done just a couple of weeks ago found that Republicans and Democrats alike uh, very broadly support increasing research and development funding um, in agriculture to help with climate resilience and climate mitigation. So I think that's one clear next step that we can take. And likewise is broad support for conservation programs. The Department of Agriculture provides billions of dollars every year to help farmers adopt environmentally friendly practices. And there's lots of debate about what should be considered environmentally friendly, how much should livestock get, how much should farmers get. But, but very broadly, people want to provide more support um, to farmers to steward their environment. So that's where I would start. Yeah, I, I, I agree that there's a lot of support for that. I think that the road from uh, uh, money being spent to fund these programs to better animal a better animal agriculture system is a little bit tenuous but i agree that it's a place to start so um we didn't do that very successfully <laughs> so and i think but i think that's real i think that that the the differences that play out on this panel play out in public discourse all the time. And it points out the difficulty of talking about these things uh, uh, sort of coolly, rationally, in a fact-based way. Um, but but it, it's so frustrating for a lot of people because I do think a lot of people are bringing similar values to this and just seeing a different path to it. So to that end, one of the questions that, that came up here, and it's sort of our, you know, get out of this conversation free card, is plant-based and cell-based meats. And, uh, you know, we saw a whole lot of interest in them when, when you know, the Beyond Meat IPO uh, uh, hit record highs. Um, do you see real potential for uh, these meat substitutes, well, cell-based meat is real meat, plant-based meat is, is obviously made of plants. We haven't seen evidence yet that it is going, that it is displacing uh, real meat, animal-based meat. Do you think it's going to in the near term, Dan? I know you've spent a lot of time on this issue. In the long term, I do. In the near term, uh, as you say, the evidence suggests the opposite, that for the most part, people aren't really switching out their you know, beef burgers for, for plant-based burgers. Sometimes they're buying both, they're experimenting. Sometimes people eat a little bit less chicken and instead more of these plant-based foods. Um, so in the short term, I think there's, pretty, there's relatively limited potential. We need to just be uh, a bit humble about what we know about um, the real dynamics here. In terms of how consumers use and respond to these products. But in the long term, mm -hmm. I think certainly there's a great scope for innovation here to develop higher quality, lower costs, more diverse products to eventually produce alternatives to many more foods. Um, that might take, it might take decades before we see real substantial changes. I kind of view the plant-based meat industry as where like the solar industry was in the 70s. It's just getting started. And it might take a is long decades, time to really. Is decades too late? I don't think anything is, is, is too late. I mean, climate change is a matter of degrees. Like we, we want to decarbonize as fast as we can and as much as possible. But I don't think there's ever a point where it's too late. 
Jennifer, you talked about putting more plants on the plate. Do you see the plant-based meats as being a palatable way for meat lovers to do that? Um, I don't think we have the data. I agree with a lot about what's been said. So just like I was saying about the grass-fed movement, I think we need to be realistic about what we know, um, what it can do, and I think it's a good stepping stone. It's one option, and we have a lot of options, a lot of potentials on the table. It's, it's not going to be the silver bullet, nor is anything else we talked about today. Okay. Well, it looks like one of the very few things that there is agreement on is changing uh, animal welfare. And so, uh, you know, one of the things we build this webinar as was talking about a more humane meat supply. So we only have a few minutes left, but I'd really like to touch on concrete policy uh, levers um, or any other kind of mechanism where we can increase the animal welfare standards for cattle, certainly, but I, I actually think, you know, pigs and chickens probably have it worse. So Dan, what do you think about that? Oh, I, I feel like we're I'm wading into a hornet's nest here, but um, I, I think that there's clear, there are really great models, I think, for legislation um, that move the needle here. We've seen uh, experimentation in California with I think, Prop 12, uh, if I remember, remember right, that requires pork that's being imported into the states uh, to be raised without gestation crates and where uh, the animals have a certain amount of space. Um, these are production systems which have been demonstrated and worked out in other places. And I think we can really learn from what's worked well in other countries, other states, and adapt that to our own circumstances. But we've seen huge fights over even the most basic animal welfare. I mean, here in Massachusetts, where I live, there was a uh, Proposition 3, I think it was, about uh, animal welfare standards. And if we see those kinds of fights in the kinds of states that are willing to do these kind, take these kinds of measures, what hope is there for a federal level policy intervention? I, I personally would not hold out hope for a federal policy intervention. I think that- Dan, our common ground is going nowhere. <laughs> really? Arius, do you have any ideas about oh. animal welfare? I think uh, building a uh, multi-stakeholder uh, standards, I think uh, for, for me, it's probably the best way to, to, to go around it. Having everybody at the table, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, animal production people, the human society and you know, all, all the different people at the table coming up together, what is their realistic uh, welfare look like? I think uh, building that kind of uh, agreement, that, I think that's the best way to move, to, to move forward. Unfortunately, there tends to be a very big gap between what producers see as realistic and what animal welfare advocates see as realistic. So there's there's a lot of, of ground to be bridged. Jennifer. One thing that we can do that bridges the environmental issues with the animal welfare issues is stop trying to get waivers for line speed slaughter increases, you know, that it's totally inhumane. And we haven't talked about the, the humans who work in this system, which is a whole different topic. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I think that's a really important one. Um, uh, and yeah, that I think that goes high on the list. And I think we would get a lot of agreement on that one. Do you have any for the, the, uh, the animals before they end up at the slaughterhouse? Well, I think that concentrated animal feeding operations, I'm trying to not say factory farms, Ernest, but um, I think that that is an area where a lot of people can actually create, there's gestation crates, there's there's all kinds of um, areas where we should avoid greenwashing and we should be more realistic about the animals and what they're actually experiencing. And on that note, we are we are gonna wrap up here. And I'm sorry to all of you who asked questions um, it, that were long specific questions and I, I just don't have the bandwidth to try and read them. I needed somebody to help me sort them out. So I'm so sorry, but all of these people here are on Twitter. And so we have this conversation in public all the time. Please come, please join us. Obviously there's no easy answers and we're just gonna keep hashing away until we try and improve the system. And thanks so much for joining us today.